Okay, well, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Dominic Tarpey. I'm here at Langley Porter and the UCSF Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. Welcome to today's Grand Rounds. I'm one of the presenters, but really not the main presenter. I'm gonna be facilitating primarily. I'm a clinical social worker and analyst here at Langley Porter. And our topic today is about involuntary commitment uh, for patients with and individuals with psychiatric conditions in psychiatric hospitals, as well as other hospitals like emergency rooms. And I'm very pleased, and this is a grand rounds at the UCSF Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and here in San Francisco. So I want to introduce our speakers. I'm just very grateful that they are able to join us. We've had them before in our grand round series, but it's been several years. So we thought it was time to invite them back to us. And this time we're doing it on Zoom, of course. So we have Greg Bryan, attorney and counselor at law, <clears throat> and who is with us uh, in her role of representing uh, patients during the hearings. And she's appointed through the Superior Court of San Francisco. And she has her own practice as well with doing um, a lot with uh, juvenile dependency and child welfare law. And, did her tra legal training at the University of San Francisco Law School. And then with Greg is Julian Saperstein, Commissioner of the Superior Court of California in the County of San Francisco as well. And uh, usually I think of Julian as the hearing uh, officer for, for the hearings. And so, and that's, uh, when we talk about the hearings, we're talking about the uh, different hearings that are defined under the Welfare and Institution Code uh, that we'll talk about in a lot more detail. So uh, I may have left out some things and Julian and Greg can certainly add, but I wanna get into our discussion and what we're thinking about today is let, I do have a few slides we'll go through, but mostly we wanna spend the hour inviting all of you to bring your questions and comments and conundrums to Julian and Greg so that we can have more of a conversational Q and A type of time together. Um, but let me go through a few slides, just as we typically do in these grand rounds. Uh, the three of us, not, we have no disclosures, no conflicts to disclose. Um, here are just our learning objectives in a sort of a general sense that, but certainly hopefully we'll cover some other things than just what we're talking about in these learning objectives. And I, just for some context, this is a, a kind of a nice visual of, uh, and it's actually, I think, from LA County, but LPS refers to the Lanterman Petra Short Act. I think most people are aware of that, but that's the, the law that uh, kind of undergirds all of this. And this is a nice uh, reference to uh, just visual in terms of all the holds we're talking about. And I, I'm kind of just using the term holds, psych holds. I think that's kind of the generic language, but you know, there's more obviously legally or technical, uh, technically correct language to use here. And with this are the different criteria that are permitted under each hold in the court proceedings. And Julie and Greg can speak to this as well, but certainly there are differences between the count, all the different, you know, there can be differences between different counties in, San, uh, in California. Our focus today is primarily San Francisco County, but what we're talking about, of course, is California law. And just some <clears throat> additional information on just the foundation and context of all of this. As I mentioned, the Lanterman Petra Short Act in 1967 was a major overhaul of how individuals with mental health conditions were, are, you know, were treated and have been and are treated in California, especially with acute care like hospitalization. So really uh, a big focus with this overhaul, this law was protecting individuals' rights when they are hospitalized. And the Welfare and Institution Code, uh, usually the, uh, the abbreviation is WIC, is the, the legal code here in California that kind of defines or gets into the particulars of how the, you know, the, the law is uh, transmitted and more the, uh, on a procedural level. There's been many revisions over the years to LPS and WIC which is one reason uh, you know, people have these periodic trainings. Uh, there's certainly a preference or a requirement in the law to admit and treat patients voluntarily. The probable cause is the legal standard that clinicians, psychiatrists, and other 
uh, individual uh, professionals who write these holds or place patients on hold have to meet this legal standard. We can talk more about that and what that means. Um, the law and the Welfare and Institution Code very uh, defines all the specific procedures, and we'll get into that quite a bit in terms of the due process aspect of being placed on uh, a psychiatric hold. And this includes things like certification hearings, the right to a writ of habeas corpus jury trial, depending on which hold you're talking about. And very importantly, the last bullet there that individuals who have been hospitalized on a hold, you know, retain all their rights unless it's adjudicated by the court or denied for good cause. And they're very, the, the welfare and institution code and, them, and uh, you know, really define this quite, quite a bit and quite in detail. And that's why we had these very important hearings. And let me just, and just a little bit more here, we're talking about probably today, not so much about the 5150, 5585, but we can certainly spend time on that as, as we go along. But a lot of the focus is on the 5250, 5260, 5270, 5300. And if you're not aware, these numbers refer to the sections of the Welfare and Institution Code. So they're sort of shorthand for what, um, you know, when people say, ah, oh, this person's going to, you know, go from a 5150 to a 5250, that's what they're talking about is an additional 14 day stay for one or more of the three criteria. And I don't know that we need to restate it, but it's important that the other undergirding thing with this is that this law only applies to individuals who have a mental health disorder. And as a result of that disorder, meet one or more of the three criteria, danger to self, danger to other, or grave disability. I put a slide here about Reese hearings. It's a little busy. I, you know, I hope we get into this and what a Reese hearing is all about, but it refers to a legal a law, a court case from several years ago about essentially a patient having, whether they have a, the capacity to refuse psychiatric medication. And I, I'm not going to go through all of this, but let's certainly spend some time on this. It's, uh, you know, it's a big, important part of, of court proceedings and what happens on inpatient units in particular, in terms of patients having the capacity to refuse or um, not refuse medication. And if found, and you know, what you do if you feel like the patient doesn't have capacity. Um, I'm gonna just scroll down. I put some quiz questions here, but I wanna go to some questions that we can kind of use to prime the pump with our discussion. And I'll stop after, we'll just kind of use these as a few questions to go through. But what I'd like to do as much as we can, if you want to come off mute and ask a question, let's try that. If it gets a little too crazy with too many people talking at once, We'll use the chat and monitor it that way. But just to kind of get us started, one of the questions that we queried some of our team was uh, th these questions here. So I'll just read it. Is there a lower burden of proof for a 5260 to be certified compared to a 5270? And I'm going to let Julian and Greg, they work closely together to you know, take their turns or however they want to answer these. But um, why don't we start with that one, Julian and Greg? All right, <clears throat> there definitely is not a lower burden of proof for a 5260 compared to a 5270. In all of these certification review hearings, the burden of proof is as low as it gets in the law. It's probable cause, which means you don't even have to say that the evidence shows it's more likely than not that the situation is the way the doctor is proclaiming. It's simply that there's good reason to believe that it might be. And, and that applies both to 5260 and to 5270. I would like to add just a little quick comment here that 5260 is only for a patient who is suicidal. Uh, the 5250 danger to self which is a two week hold preceding the 5260. The issue is not whether the patient is suicidal, but whether they're a, a danger to themselves as a result of a mental disorder. So <clears throat> 5260 has a different 
issue to be decided, but the burden of proof does not change. And same with 5270, they're both uh, probable cause, which is the lightest burden on the doctor. Greg, did you have anything to add? Um, only that we don't do 5260 hearings in the hospitals, that the patient has a right to a writ and the public defender would represent them. So um, they're fairly infrequent, but when we get them, um, they need the patient needs to be notified that they call the public defender's office um, for a hearing if they want to contest that matter. And then the only other thing I would say is, um, yes, it's probable cause for all of the hearings except for Reese hearings, um, which are obviously not the involuntary hold, but it's a much higher burden for the Reese hearing um, to prove capacity, which is by clear and convincing evidence. So I just wanted to make that distinction. And just to fill in a little bit about a probable cause as a, what that standard means, uh, can you speak to that a little bit? So what does it mean to meet the probable cause standard? Well, as I said, um, it, probable cause is a, basically if, if you have a hunch and your hunch isn't way out in left field, that's probable cause. In other words, you say that there's a reasonable possibility that this person is going to meet the criteria for the hold, then that's enough to sustain your burden. You don't have to say it's more likely than not that if they go out, they're gonna hurt themselves or that if they go out, they won't be able to take care of their basic needs. You just have to say there's a reasonable possibility that they won't be able to take care of themselves or that they might hurt another person. Uh, <clears throat> It's pretty loosey goosey, but uh, you have to have some basis. And I don't know, Dominic, if you want to know what a clear and convincing evidence actually is for the yes. race hearings. Um, it's it's in, it's much higher, um, and it's described as. Uh, a standard that is so clear as to leave no substantial doubt, sufficiently strong to command the unhesitating assent of every reasonable mind. So um, the burden is much, much higher uh, on uh, race and capacity hearings. Yeah, there's an um, intermediate, which is in the civil case, it's just preponderance of the evidence, which is what I was saying earlier, more likely than not, but clear and convincing is just shy of beyond a reasonable doubt. So it's one of the higher standards, but that's for Reese's, not for these involuntary detentions. Okay. Um, well, why don't we go to the next question? I've heard grave disability refers to an inability to accept food, clothing, shelter, should be given rather than an inability to secure those things for oneself. I've also heard people say the latter and not the former. Which is it? It's both. Uh, it's, it's either one or the other or both. In other words, if a person has lots of assets or ability to take care of their financial requirements, but they're too disorganized to use their resources, that would be a basis for a finding of grave disability. And you also have the case where a person is too disorganized to get what they need and they don't have the resources. So they're in a, a worse position than the person who has resources, but they're both subject to the hold if they're unable to use the resources available to them. And isn't this due to a mental health condition? or gravely disabled? Yes, it has to be based on a mental disorder. All of the holds without exception are based on a mental disorder. That's a prerequisite. In other words, if a person has lost his job and somebody took his wallet and he has no assets, but no mental disorder, he's just down on his luck. He does not fall within the parameters of the LPS law. So without a mental disorder, basically, the, there is no case.
Okay, well then let's move to the next question. If a patient is a danger to, th to themselves, not based on suicide risk, but because their mental disorder makes it hard to maintain their body's physical condition, then can that be an argument for danger to self rather than grave disability? That's a, a loaded question. Los Angeles tried to amend the definition of grave disability to include a person who doesn't take care of medical issues because a lot of people, homeless people were dying down in Los Angeles and they were saying, we can't detain them and, and help them get over their medical issues because they don't meet the criteria for grave disability about food, clothing and shelter. And so to that extent, no, they do not uh, constitute either grave disability or danger to self. However, as I mentioned earlier, 5260 requires an actual desire to commit suicide, whereas 5250 only talks about danger to self. So if a person is not maintaining his body physical condition because he's wandering into traffic, believing that he has an invisible force field so that cars will bounce off it before they hit him, or if he feels that he can jump out the window because he knows how to fly, those would be danger to self under 5250. They would not be under 5260. However, if it's just that they cannot take care of themselves, uh, that's not danger to self. Julian, though, there are times where we have patients who, um, for instance, aren't taking their insulin and their blood sugar is through the roof and, and you have sustained holds on, on some of those patients who are not taking care of themselves. Um, right, that's what the law should be according to Los Angeles. <laughs> and sometimes uh, I will bend the law. That, I had a patient, for example, whose arm, his hand, his right hand was swollen to the size of a grapefruit. And all he wanted to do was get out and use more methamphetamine. Um, I sustained the hold. I said, he just wasn't able to take care of himself. And that probably was a legitimate call because he was homeless and with a swollen arm like that, it was probably in, he was probably not capable of providing for his basic needs. However, uh, it was getting a little bit close to the edge of the law. The good news is I saw him a couple months later and his right hand was completely healed. He, he stayed in the hospital long enough to get the antibiotics and his hand was okay. They didn't have to cut it off, which was going to be the almost inevitable result if I had let him go. And I don't know whether it's, pro, um, you know, the probate code 3200 is um, the legal way of um, having a patient declared, it, it, well, lack, lacking capacity in order to make medical decisions. So there is a legal um, means to do, to get medical treatment for a patient who lacks capacity. Um, it's not through the LPS, it's through the probate code 3200, which it seems that the only hospital that does those in San Francisco is general, but that is something that's available to all hospitals. It is a statewide law. And I'd like to make a, make a pitch for anybody who has the, their, their field of expertise involves uh, cases where a patient is neglecting medical needs and is incompetent to make medical decisions. Probate 3200 is a vehicle specifically designed for this. And it just doesn't seem that many hospitals are willing to, to use it, which is a shame because uh, some very serious physical injuries or death can result from failure to use probate 3200. But as, I, as Greg pointed out, in San Francisco, at least there's only one hospital, San Francisco General, that makes use of it. And they make extensive use of it, productive use too. And I think that speaks to the fact that uh, welfare and institution code holds are really just about psychiatric illness. I mean, there's 
I mean, I think there are with uh, LPS conservatorship, you know, you can do an affidavit A or B that might have some medical powers granted alongside the uh, the conservatorship, the conservator being able to hospitalize someone psychiatrically. But uh, otherwise, you know, the 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 5250, the 5260, 52, uh, 5150 don't include any medical powers. Does that sound and right? And I just want to- That's yeah, absolutely that. correct. You're right. Go ahead. Sorry, Judge, go ahead. No, I, I'm finished. I just was telling Dominic he's right. Yeah, um, but I, I guess I just want to say that I think one of the reasons that General does does them and um, is that there is such a backlog in this city for conservatorships going through. So we have people who, you know, they can start at general on the psych unit or even on the medical unit. They need medical treatment. And I don't know what's going on, but there the people are waiting at least a year, I think, for some of these conservatorships to come through. So they don't get their affidavit A or B. And therefore they do need to have, there needs to be some um, legal decision maker for the um, medical treatment. Another reason the hospitals other than general don't use 3200 is general has the city attorney who doesn't cost them anything. Whereas the private hospitals have to go out and hire outside counsel and pay money to get a 30, uh, probably 3200 petition going. I guess that they don't wanna spend the money. And, and I can understand that in economic terms, but as, the result is that there's some people who are suffering major medical catastrophes. So we have a question in the chat. What about the use of affidavit A under LPS holds and not probate? Can you talk about what that may cover and what you may know about our county's use of this order? Those uh, affidavit A only applies to persons on conservatorships. Uh, the Topic of today's discussion, as I understand it, is 5250, 5260, 5270, and affidavit A simply doesn't apply in those cases. There is none. Uh, affidavit B, I have made an arrangement with the probate court where I will hear an affidavit B and then uh, submit my ruling to the probate court who generally will rubber stamp it, but I have no authority to do an affidavit A. Uh, and the only way you can get an affidavit A is to have a conservatorship in place. After that, you can do it. And by conservatorship, we're talking about LPS, not probate conservatorship. LPS conservatorship, yes. Right. Which is what there's an enormous backlog in, which is why I think they're doing the, you know, why the probate code 3200 is a good idea. Plus the, the legislature had a pretty good idea in my opinion. They said sometimes a person may not really fit into the criteria for uh, LPS, but they definitely need some medical attention and they're not doing it. If you can demonstrate the, the criteria that are put down in the statute, then you can get their medical needs taken care of. And the, the problem is that very few hospitals are taking advantage of this gift that the legislature gave them. And Julian, correct me if I'm wrong and, or Greg, but you know, in the 5150-5585 training that the county has for um, mental health clinicians to be able to be certified to write a hold, the probable cause legal standard is a person of ordinary care and prudence would have the same suspicion that you would have as the clinician evaluating the individual. Does that sound correct? Are you talking about just the probable for cause the, standard for probable cause to issue a 5150? Yes, that's right. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. They don't have to be certain. They don't even have to be, as I said earlier, they don't have to say it's more likely than not. They just have to say there's a reasonable suspicion. Is it, I'm not just being foolish here. You, I actually have a reasonable suspicion that this person is at risk for one of those three grounds.
Well, we had one question through the chat and one, uh, so I, I just, I know we've been kind of going through these questions here, but I invite everyone who is participating uh, to, you know, feel free to come off mute or put something through the chat if you have any question that we, of anything we've covered so far, but anything else related to these holds. And I think it's also, especially if you've been involved in some of these hearings, you know, what have been some of the conundrums that you have faced either in writing a hold or through the hearings that you've experienced and some of the gray areas that maybe you've struggled with or maybe changes in the law recently that you're you know, trying to grapple with. Um, I think obviously the goal is to have you know, a high level of consistency across hospitals and clinicians and hearings so that you know, patients' rights are protected um, but and and these hold done properly, clearly, and patients get the treatment and, and their safety. So the next question here, and because I think this is this is in the welfare and institution code, but and maybe I'm not sure if Julie and Greg can speak to it, but what provisions are there for chronic inebriates? in San Francisco under the Welfare and Institution Code? Not many. Uh, there are a number of locked facilities that do take chronic inebriates, but there, there are far more people who are eligible for them than there are bed spaces. So uh, basically a chronic inebriate, even somebody with end stage alcohol liver disease uh, can easily get a 5250 and maybe even a 5270 but after that they're let go I, I still remember one person they said if he goes out on one more bench he will die and I said so I assume you're going to send him to a uh, a locked facility for chronic inebriates and they said no we don't have any bed space we're just going to let him go and I was a little disturbed by that but uh, it's just the harsh reality. There are there are there are places out there, but there aren't enough bed space for all the people who could use it. Um, a question: Must the advisement be filled out in the field or only at the hospital? And I'm not sure if, um, if that's the 51, the admission advisement or a later advisement, but uh, if you will. Well, 5150 is filled out in the field. A 5250 can be filled out in the field. Sometimes, for example, a doctor will be on the weekend, he'll be at home and they say, Mr. So-and-so is in need of a 5250. The doctor can fill it out and email it back to the, to the unit. So, where the form is filled out is not relevant. The fact that it gets served on the patient is the important issue. I think, um, I mean, obviously 5150s are filled out in the ER too, or in the ED. So, I mean, that is in the hospital. If, you know, if and when that becomes something that the doctors consider appropriate. But a lot, a lot of times a police officer out yeah. on the street will issue a 5150. Uh, the, then the person will come to the hospital and there will be a legitimate 72 hour hold on him. But if the doctor wants to keep him further, they can fill out a form and serve it on him. They don't have to be in the hospital when they do it. They usually are, but. As I say, sometimes during the weekend, they'll be called at home for that purpose. And I'm sure no one in San Francisco would ever do this, but we hear that in numerous other counties, uh, hospitals do back-to-back 5150s. Um, and I know that some hospitals in San Francisco have refused to take patients when the out-of-county hospitals have done back-to-back 5150s, which is totally against the law, um, but yeah, don't ever do a second one. <laughs> and 
uh, one thing about the advisement, I mean, of course, there's on the 5150, 5585 form, there's the oral advisement in the upper right hand corner that the person writing the hold must read to the person being detained. And then there's the admission advisement, which is a piece of paper that's given to the patient when they're um, admitted to a you know, designated facility, a psychiatric facility, or, you know, uh, and they go beyond just the emergency room. I have, a, you know, one thing that I've wondered about um, during 5250, 5270, these hearings, uh, to what extent, Julian and Greg, do you ever look at the 5150 or the 5585? Is that ever part of the preparation for the hearing um, and, or the hearing during the hearing itself? And if so, if there's issues with, you know, there's like it's incomplete or something problematic or inconsistent, that how does that get sorted out? The 5150 is, is very important for the 5250 hearing. But the 5150 isn't binding. In other words, you may bring a patient in for danger to self on a 5150, but the doctor, after the three day, the 72 hour observation period, may conclude that the person is more gravely disabled than danger to self. Uh, the reason that the 5150 is important is it, it's simply because. It's evidence. I need more facts when I'm making my decision. And the reason that the patient was brought in is oftentimes of great importance. Uh, I have to know if they're going for grave disability. Well, what is it about this patient that he or she was not able to take care of herself? If they can bring in the 5150 and talk about the squalor in the apartment and flooding and you know, uh, whatever it may be that the patient wasn't staying in there because of paranoia. All of that is uh, information that may be in the 5150. A, a well-written 5150 is an enormous assistance, but it isn't binding on the doctor. It's simply the beginning of the observation period. The doctor then draws his or her own conclusions. Um, and I will say that I think it's very good practice to um, have the 5150 available at the hearing and that to be kind of the lead off of, of the beginning of the hearing. Um, that is how the patient got there. It does lay the groundwork. As the judge says, it's really important information for him. Um, and I personally would like to have the 5150 available um, in the old days when we had paper records, I could look at through the files. Now I don't get to see the files before the hearings. But um, one of the reasons I say it's important to have the document or access to the document is that um, lots of things get lost in translation and every word can count. Um, and so uh, I would prefer it to be read out than to some, for some, a doctor to summarize it because there are important differences between summaries and the actual document. But it is the place to start, I think, with the um, hearing. If there are people out in the audience who prepare these hearings, doctors who prepare these hearings or social workers who prepare these hearings, I really would ask that everyone who does this have the 5150 available because in many cases I've had to say, well, what brought the patient into the hospital? And the doctor will say, I don't know. And I'm thinking this isn't good enough preparation. I need to know why the patient's in the hospital and I should have the 5150 available. And sometimes they'll say, okay, well, I'll go find it. And we take a break and they find it and then they read it. But better preparation would be to have it available in every case. It is an incredibly important document for the hearing. There, I don't remember what hospital, but there is a hospital that actually, oh, Jewish Home, that actually has the 5150. When I go to look at the documents, they have that attached as well. So it's really helpful for me as the advocate to talk to the patient, get some background also, um, and be able to talk to the patient about it. So if you feel so inclined to put a copy of it, just as you know, a piece of information with the 5250, I would have no objection. All right, thank you. Here's a question in the chat. I imagine you have had the experience of patients prevailing at hearings. 
and then something awful happens. How do you cope with the vicarious trauma of this work? How do you cope with potential feelings of guilt if a client prevails and then suicides or commits murder? That's from Rachel, Julian. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been, I've had that one in the back of my mind for the entire time I've been doing this, which is 25 years or so. Um, I can say that to the best of my knowledge, nobody has gone out and killed herself after I've let her go or him go. Uh, I don't know how many of you know about Paul Ekman, but his whole facial expression expertise was based on a case where he interviewed a patient and listened to her carefully and took her on film and decided after having listened to her for about a 20 minute conversation that her protestations that she had no longer any desire to harm herself were true. She went out and killed herself the same day um, and it devastated him. I don't wanna get devastated like that, but it is a, it's a hazard and it's what happens to people. It's, it's not because a person is a failure. You have to be very careful not to get into that situation. Um, but it is one that's always in the back of my mind. Uh, I had one case where there was absolutely no reason for me to sus sustain the hold on a patient, but I just knew in my gut that I couldn't let him go. And so I sustained the hold. He took a writ of habeas corpus, went to the probate court judge who let him go. And that very same day, he poured a gallon of gasoline on his head and lit it. Took him about four months to die. Um, I didn't do it. And so I feel I, I don't spend the night thinking, oh my God, I screwed up. But it would have been devastating. And I don't know whether anybody had the courage to tell the probate judge what happened after she let him go. But they should have, because that way she would have learned not to, uh, well, to be careful about these decisions. Um, but as I say, I have that in the back of my mind with every single case I do. And as far as I know, I've dodged the bullet so far. I don't know, Greg, do you, when you have a patient, do you have conflicting ideas about if I let, if I prevail and this person leaves, maybe they'll hurt themselves or somebody else. Are you asking me? I'm asking you. Yeah, um, well, it's happened. There are times where I really wish I didn't win a hearing. <laughs> um, and I, get, I sort of have to let that go. I don't know that anyone's, I mean, you know, you make the decision. So, so luckily I have that barrier. I can't well, take, but um, we all do the best we can do. And very honestly, you know, my job is to advocate for what the client says they want. Um, I, I, like to have as much information about a situation and a patient before I speak with them in order to prepare myself and them for the hearing. It's really helpful for me to get an idea of what the discharge plan is or um, what the issues are before I talk to them because then I can try to round the conversation in, a, you know, in that way. Um, and also, you know, try to get get more of a collaborative um, working situation going where, um, where, you know, I can let them know that the doc, this is what the doctor wants, this is what their family wants, blah, 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 and, and try to move it in a direction. And, you know, there are times where we've had what we call or felt were therapeutic hearings where, you know, we all, we each have our separate role in these hearings but we all are, and, and, and our roles, you know, are importantly different, but also we are all there for the client's best interest and, and, and what's, uh, and to try to work with them, I think. So I'm not quite articulating this very well, but, um, 
I think we all feel better when we can have more information and work together and, and have it be a conversation. Very often our hearings are more conversations than they are adversarial situations. And I think that actually benefits for the, the patients much better than some idea that, that it's an adversarial situation. I will say um, uh, suicide and murder are cases which are particularly troublesome. I have had many cases where I've let a patient go on the allegation of grave disability and they may have come right back. Those cases are not so disturbing because the criteria in grave disability are such that uh, the way I see it, the patient has a right, they have enough there, they have enough resources, they have enough mental resources that if they do it right, they'll be okay. And, and frequently this happens with drug cases. So somebody will go out, they'll say, I'm gonna go to a drug rehab, I'm gonna take care of myself, I'm gonna reinvent my life. And then they find some methamphetamine and they're back next week. And I say, okay, well, I'll remember that. I do remember that we were just here last time and I, the next time I will sustain the hold. And sometimes, there are cases where they simply don't meet the criteria, but they keep on ending up back in the hospital. And those are frustrating, but they don't cause me to lose sleep at night. I, I just think if the law had a more comprehensive approach, I might uh, have sustained the hold, but they just don't meet the criteria. Well, and if society had anything for them, honestly, it's not just the law, you know. Right. Unfortunately, we don't have housing and we don't have programs and we don't have them. But what it does come to somebody's life at risk, I take a very careful approach and uh, try to be as rigorous as I can in, in making the decision. And with that, I the next question in the chat, is collateral information from providers outside of the hospital helpful in making decisions or would you rather not hear from us? And I, you know, the, what I think of here are two pieces of getting collateral information to the psychiatrist or the mental health team who's doing working up their assessment and then you know, information that is occurring within the hearing itself that's being brought forward. That information is very important to me. Uh, it's, and I ask for it if the doctor doesn't volunteer it. Uh, the, you know, the doctor will say the patient's outside doctor provi provides the following information. There are, the standards of evidence in these hearings do away with hearsay rules altogether. So even though the outside therapist isn't available, for cross-examination, their input is still relevant to the hearing. And it helps me a lot. I'm sure that the attorneys who represent the patient must feel frustrated because they can't cross-examine the outside provider, but um, that's just the way the law works. And, and I find it very helpful. I, and I, I just try to find out if the outside provider has been heavily involved in what kind of qualifications they have, but I can't cross-examine them either. Um, and as, as the advocate, I'm not sure how, it, I mean, yes, it can be frustrating, but very, very honestly, um, if a patient has a relationship with an outside provider, it's often very, it makes the patient feel more comfortable that the doctor there is talking to the outside provider, very often I think it helps round things out and makes that patient feel like, oh, at least they're talking to someone I, I'm already working with, if they have a good relationship with them. And, and often they do. And then, it, then, then I think they get to feel that there's a team working with them and that the doctor in the hospital is more informed than would have been otherwise. And, and I, think that's, I think that's more helpful and that patients feel like that's more helpful than not, honestly. I sometimes get letters from a parent that go into great detail about why they feel that their beloved child really does need further treatment. And they'll go into great detail about the kinds of things that that 
patient has done and why they think that if I were to let them go, they might do such things again. And I find those letters very helpful. We have the next question. From your perspective, what are the differences between when a 5150 is placed by a clinician versus a peace officer? To me, that's almost not relevant because I only get the patient after a uh, clinician, a doctor has evaluated the patient for a period of time up to 72 hours and has come to an independent conclusion as to whether the hold should be extended. If the police officer uh, brings the patient in, then uh, they usually will give a pretty good report. I've had a, a number of times where I've given uh, lectures to police officers who do the 5150s and in San Francisco, I think they do a pretty good job. They are trained as to what they're supposed to report and their factual basis for the hold is sometimes better written than a clinician's uh, 5150. So I, I, I would not place higher credibility on the uh, clinician over the peace officer. Um, the main source of my information is the doctors observed the patient in the hospital, but both the uh, peace officer and the clinician who wrote the 5150, I have valuable input if they do it right. And I'm just thinking um, the 5150, sometimes it will present the story, which of course we, wa we wanna start the 5250 off with that information, but it can be really interesting on how much someone has recompensated by the time or, or you know, the we get to the 5250. So I mean, I think it is helpful no matter what to um, to have that information. And that's, you know, often just a, it's not a, a clinical opinion, but it is um, often, uh, you know, independent observations, which are important to know, not through a clinician, but just lay witnesses even. You know, I wanted to ask about I think, in, I suspect all the hospitals in San Francisco and probably across the state struggle with this. When you have these gaps that occur uh, or can occur on, you know, between the end of the, the time frame of the 5150 or 5585 and the start of the 5250, et cetera, or, you know, somehow the hearing is supposed to happen, but it doesn't happen because uh, some mess up with, paperwork and in signaling and these kind of bureaucratic processes that occur, but, you know, there's a jeopardy to the patient and their rights, you know, when, you know, there's a time, you know, it might be half a day, it might be a day, it might be 30 minutes, but they somehow, you know, are in between two holds potentially. And I'm sure you will encounter this and have to work, try to sort it out in terms of the team bringing this forward to you, whichever, you know, the, the psychiatry team or the care team. So can you talk about that? Just sort of a broad question of how you grapple with that and what kind of things you see? In a broad sense, it's jurisdictional. The, the law provides that if a patient is dissatisfied with the 5250, and if the 5250 is served within the 72 hours, then the hearing shall be within four days of the service. And uh, under, I think, Code of Civil Procedure Section 1008, I'm not positive about that citation, but uh, if there's a holiday, say we recently had uh, Indigenous Peoples Day, and so if the hearing should have been on Monday, then they're entitled to the hearing to be uh, extended for the holiday. But if, the patient is up for a hearing on say Monday and it's not a holiday and they don't get their hearing because nobody advised the lawyer that there, this person was up for a hearing, then there is a reasonable argument which uh, is that the patient was deprived of her ability to contest the hold 
and that is a violation of her right of due process, so I should lose jurisdiction. And the attorneys have made that argument with me frequently. Fortunately, not that frequently because the hospitals are pretty good about not doing that. But that is an argument that carries a lot of weight. However, the patient can waive the irregularity. If they don't really want to leave, they can say, okay, well, I missed my hearing date, but I don't care. Um, and the hospitals can occasionally come up with a reason which convinces me that there was a reason to allow the gap, but at least at core, that is a jurisdictional defect and the patient should be allowed to leave. Greg, did you want to add anything? No, I mean, it's, he's right. Um, and um, I, I think the frustrating <laughs> thing is the occasional time he decides that um, he's gonna hold the patient anyway. And I, I just think, you know, I don't think that's fair or right for the patient. Um, and I will absolutely talk to patients to see if they waive the irregularity and they do. And we, you know, and then it's not a problem, but if somebody wants to leave particularly and the hospital hasn't done it in time, that's really an injustice, I think. There are nuances, but I, 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 I would spend the next two or three hours getting into the nuances. So I'm just leaving it as the basics that it is a jurisdictional defect. And, well, and with that is a question, what are the most common errors or omissions you see on legal holds, which uh, kind of well, talk if about we're talking what about, else do you see? There are two kinds of errors and omissions. One is like what we were just talking about. That's a legal mistake. The other is more of a practical one. And, and for example, we were saying earlier, it would be really nice if the doctor had the 5150 available so that they could at least give me the lay of the land. Um, so that kind of error and omission happens all the time. But over the years, I think I've trained most doctors in San Francisco at least to put their cases together pretty well. The one defect that I see most is in the Reese affidavits. They are usually of almost zero value. They, they basically say the patient has psychosis not otherwise specified, doesn't want to take the medication. Here's what we would like to give her. And she says, no, that, that really doesn't put me on the ground with my feet running. If they say, well, she thrived for the last 10 years on Zyprexa, she discontinued it, and ever since then, she's decompensated. She lost her job, she lost her home, and she uh, never complained of any issues when she was taking it. That would be something. And then if they go on and say, and she doesn't want to take it because she says that it's infected with uh, uh, fetuses that have been ground up and put into the pill. That, that kind of information is important, and it's it only comes out in testimony. It, it's better if it comes out on the paper. That's, that's a practical error and omission in my opinion. Uh, legally speaking, the doctors usually get it right. Um, just to piggyback on that, I would say the, the more detail that's written in the 5250, the better. Um, just for all the reasons that the judges said, like then there's, and, and also for me in terms of being an advocate, that it gives me, you know, an idea of what I'm looking at and what to discuss with the patient. Um, and, and as far as I'm concerned, that's sort of a due process issue. It's like, if there's not a whole lot written in the 5250, I don't have a lot of notice and the patient doesn't necessarily have a lot of notice of why you're actually asking to hold them. And, um, and so then you get into the hearing and all this stuff comes out and that's not really fair or right in terms of due process. And, and uh, to go beyond that, there are occasions I've had where the, the hearing concludes and there's not enough evidence for me to sustain the hold. And after the patient leaves the room, the doctor gives me new information, which if I had known it, 
would have been more than sufficient to sustain the whole. And those are always kind of irritating. It's not, an, it's not a, a violation of the law, it's just a violation of good, good procedure. Also on the Reese affidavit, it's important to say which medications the doctor wants to give the patient so that the attorney can prepare for it. My job is not to say that, well, I think you can give her Haldol, but I, I just don't think that Risperdal would work for this particular patient. I'm not a doctor, but the, the uh, attorney should know which medications the doctor has in mind so that they can prepare and talk with the patient about what is in store for them. And that is also an issue of informed consent. I mean, if, if you don't say what you're asking the patient to take, then how can you say the patient's not taking it? So you really, it is very helpful to be, well, to be detailed. Otherwise we, we don't really know what you're asking, you know, what they're refusing if you're not specific about what you're requesting. And so as- it, Okay, go ahead. Hmm? Just to make it clear, when I do sign a Reese order, it's not an order that uh, specifies which medication the patient is to get. It's simply saying that the patient is not competent to refuse medication and that the doctor can have the final say. If the patient refuses, the doctor can either change medication or give up or say, no, you have to take Haldol or whatever it might be, but it's not my decision. My decision is simply to say that the doctors got the last word. Well, we only have a moment left. Uh, there is one really great question that I, is what aspects of the LPS system do you think could be improved? Uh, if you want to tackle that, uh, if you had on your wish list one item, what might that be? I personally am uh, in favor of LA's wish to expand the definition of grave disability to include failure to take care of critical medical issues. Um, I've kind of bent the law and I don't like to bend the law, but sometimes I feel that it's just absolutely essential to save a person's life or limb. And I'd rather that the law were amended to include that. I've spoken with some very respectable doctors whose opinion I value who don't agree with me, but uh, just being down in the trenches all the time, I think that would be a good way to uh, expand the law. Greg, last word, anything? Um, I'm not so much, my, uh, my hope, my idea of what would be improved would be the services. So it's not an LPS issue. It's like, what, what is available to, to help the, <laughs> to, to support people who are in the LPS. And I don't, you know, societally we don't have it. And so that would be my wish on my wishes. Okay, well, uh, and I think uh, most of us would agree with that. And with that, let's go ahead and close our grand rounds for today. Thank you both to Greg and Julian, and thank, thank you everyone for participating today. Thanks, Tony. Thank you.